We often want to turn analog systems like parametric filters into digital ones. This can be done in various ways, for example via the bilinear transform, a mapping of the S-plane into the Z-plane. In this video, I'll show you what is the bilinear transform, what are its properties, why do we need it, and how to derive it. Hi everyone, this is Jan Wilczek from TheWolfSound.com and if you're new to this channel, I teach you how to process sound using self-written software. Over the course of previous videos, we discussed how to design a filter for parametric equalizers. We learned that in order to have an efficient, stable and controllable infinite impulse response IIR filter, we need to design what is called an analog prototype. We then need to digitize this analog prototype. And in this video, I will explain to you how this digitization process looks. Our goal is to convert a transfer function in the analog S domain to a transfer function in the digital Z domain. This can be done in various ways, but the one most used in practice for musical applications is the bilinear transform. The bilinear transform is a change of variables, a mapping of the J omega analog frequency axis of the S domain of the S plane into the unit circle of the Z plane. So the left half plane of the S plane gets mapped into the interior of the unit circle of the Z plane. The bilinear transform is given by the following formula where T is the sampling interval, so the inverse of the sampling rate. So if our transfer function HA in the analog domain is given by some formula, we can just substitute this equation of the bilinear transform for S to obtain the digital transfer function in the Z domain. And we can, of course, invert that process, so to go from the digital transfer function to the analog transfer function. I am going to derive the bilinear transform now. If you're not interested, feel free to skip to the next part of the video. Okay, so here we have the bilinear transform title. And in order to derive the bilinear transform, well, there are two ways to do this, but we'll do the one which consists of approximating a continuous time integrator. A continuous time integrator is a system at whose output we have the integral of the input. So the output is an integral from 0 to t of x to d to. And now if we do the Laplace transform of the system is supposed to be an L. Uh, we obtain y of s is equal to 1 over s x of s. And that is why a continuous time integrator is often depicted as x of s, arrow, and here we have the transfer function which is 1 of s and we obtain y of s. And now what we want to do is we want to approximate this integrator with a digital system. So we want to have a transfer function g of z, which is somehow similar to one over s. And how do we do this? Well, we start by evaluating this equation here for discrete time points. So we have y of n t is equal to an integral from 0 to n t of x to d to. And uh, this t here is simply the sampling interval, so which is 1 over fs, which is the sampling rate. Okay, so now let's write out this integral in two parts. So the first part will be from 0 to n minus 1 t x tau d tau, 
And the second part will be exactly from n minus 1 t to n t. x tall t tall. And now, if we look at it, then uh, here, what we have is uh, y of n minus 1 t. And this part will approximate with that trapezoid rule. And if you don't remember what trapezoid rule is, then don't worry. Uh, the trapezoid rule as tells us that the integral from n minus 1 t to n t x tall t tall is equal to x of n minus 1 t plus x of n t, so the values on the borders of the interval multiplied by the sampling interval so the distance between these two values in the domain and divided by two because it's a trapezoid so uh, this to this equation and this uh, y of n minus 1 t we can insert back and so we obtained uh, of course uh, to be exact this is an approximation and so we have here also an approximation right when uh, y of n t y of n minus 1 t plus and this guy which is x of n minus 1 t plus x of n t times t divided by 2. Oof, it fit there. Okay, and now what we will do is we do the z transform of the system because we evaluated at the discrete points, right? So what do we have here? We have, of course, y of z and I'll just write normal equals here and then we have n minus 1 so it means delay by one sample, which after the z transform is z to the power of minus one. And here we have again z to the power of minus one x of z plus x of z uh, multiplied by t and divided by two. So we now want to uh, rearrange this equation uh, so that uh, we obtain uh, y and z. Mm, let's do this like this. Here we have 1 minus z minus 1 uh, y of z is equal to 1 plus z to the minus 1 uh, t over 2 x of z. And now, uh, as you might know, our transfer function g of z is, of course, the z transform of the output divided by the z transform of the input. And this is equal to exactly t over 2, 1 plus z minus 1. Uh, divided by 1 minus z to minus 1. But this is the approximation that we wanted, right? The approximation of the continuous time integrator. So now, if we take this formula and invert it, we obtain s is equal to 2 over t, 1 minus z to the minus 1, Find it by 1 plus z to the minus 1. And this is our bilinear transform formula that we just derived. Let's now examine the properties of this mapping. It is called bilinear because the numerator and the denominator of this mapping are linear in z. 
As we said, the left half plane of the S plane gets mapped into the interior of the unit circle in the Z plane. And that means that all the poles from the left half plane of the S plane get mapped into the interior of the unit circle in the Z plane. That means that stable analog filters are transformed into stable digital filters, what is a very desirable property in the context of musically useful filters. In the same way, the analog frequency axis of the S plane gets mapped onto the unit circle of the Z plane. That means that the transfer function over an infinite domain gets squashed around the finite length circle. Mapping of infinite objects into finite ones isn't for free. That means that the bilinear transform processes the phase response and the amplitude response of the filter in a nonlinear way. That is why the resulting IIR filter has a nonlinear phase and the so called frequency warping occurs. Before we explain the frequency warping, it is important to mention a few other properties of the bilinear transform. The obtained digital filter has the same order as the analog prototype, and also it's optimal in the same sense. Additionally, if we have a cascade of analog filters, we can process them all with a bilinear transform or one by one. The resulting system will be the same. Now about the frequency warping. If we substitute J omega A for S, where omega a are the analog frequencies in radians per second, and e to j omega d t for z, and here omega d are digital frequencies also in radians per second, we do these substitutions in the bilinear transform mapping, we can obtain the relation between the analog and digital frequencies. This plot shows exactly what this equation already told us, that this relation is non-linear. The frequency warping means that successive equal increments along the analog frequency axis result in smaller and smaller increments in the digital frequency. To counteract the frequency warping, we introduce the so-called pre-warping. It is the scaling of the analog frequency axis so that some specific analog frequency after the bilinear transform lands onto a specific digital frequency. In other words, we want to have a pair of frequencies that have the same gain in the corresponding transfer functions. This pair of frequencies are called critical frequencies. We typically want to design our pre-warping in a way that the critical frequencies are the cutoff frequencies of our analog and digital filters. The scaling factor of pre-warping is obtained by multiplying the S to Z mapping of the bilinear transform by K. We then insert the critical frequencies and solve for K. The result is this. As you remember, we designed our analog prototype low pass to have the cutoff frequency equal to 1. We can now substitute this 1 for the critical frequency in the analog domain and thus obtain a low pass with a controllable cutoff frequency. So the final formula for the bilinear transform plus pre-warping is this. Finally, to wrap up this video, let's digitize the analog prototype low pass of order 2, which we designed with the Butterworth method. Here is its formula. And now we insert the bilinear transform with pre-warping for S. And the result is this, where W is just a helper constant. As you can see, we can control the cutoff frequency of this digital filter with omega c. But let's consider this transfer function for a second. If we change the cutoff frequency, we need to calculate at least five coefficients. Is it optimal? Definitely not. This filter is efficient only if we have a fixed cutoff frequency. If you want to change the cutoff frequency often, we'd better do by turning to Alpas based filters, which are the most efficient, the most optimal parametric filters. 
and they will be the topic of the next video. So if you don't want to miss it, then please subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. In summary, in this video, we learned that the Balinia transform is a great method to digitize the analog systems. We learned how to derive the Balinia transform by approximating a continuous time integrator. We learned the properties of the Balinia transform, such as stability and optimality preservation. And we also learn how to counteract the frequency warping with pre-warping. We also learned that when we use pre-warping, we can design our analog prototypes to have the cutoff frequency equal to 1, because this cutoff frequency we can then regulate during pre-warping so that our digital filters have the cutoff frequency that we want it to have. And finally, we digitized second-order analog Butterworth Low Pass and obtained an efficient IAR filter. Have you found this video useful? If so, please consider buying me a coffee over at buymeacoffee.com slash Jan Wilczek. Thanks. As usual, I put the even more detailed content of this video over at dwolfsound.com and I have put the link to the article in the description below. If you want to learn even more about audio programming, then I highly encourage you to subscribe to Wolfsound's newsletter, which you can find over at dwolfsound.com slash newsletter. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Take care.